A few weeks ago, we published a video all about nutrition. Why even bother with nutrition and mead? Or why would you even stagger them? Ever since that video was published, I have been under a barrage of questions in the comments here on YouTube, on the Discord, on Twitter, on Facebook. Which nutrients do we use? How much? So here, today, now, we're going to follow up with another video. Which nutrients should you use and how much? Now, nutrition in fermentation is a very convoluted topic, full of opinions and full of criticism. And the truth of the matter is that nobody really has found the perfect nutrition for fermentation. It's a work in progress. And it's also true that one general nutrition protocol isn't ideal for every single fermentation. All the things that you add to the fermentation add their own nutrients and minerals. And to achieve a perfect fermentation, you'll have to take all of that into account. So when it comes to nutrition, the best advice I can give you is find what works for you and do that. Do a little bit of experimentation, a little bit of tweaking, but find what works and stick with it. But I know that answer is so unsatisfying. So me being the wonderful person that I am, I'm taking it a little bit further. You see, if you ask 10 different brewers what's the perfect fermentation, you're gonna get 10 different answers. And they're all gonna say the other nine are wrong. And so instead of giving you just my opinion, just what I would do, I've interviewed a handful of prominent brewers and scientists and gotten their opinion, including Dr. Bray Dennard, the author of The Bomb Recipes, and Dr. Nicola Hall from Scott Labs. But first, let me tell you what I do, my typical mead-making system. I typically ferment with a neutral yeast, EC1118, and I have a starting gravity of 1.140. I'll make a basic mead, just water, honey, yeast, and nutrients. When that fermentation is finished, I'll rack that and stabilize it, and then I'll back sweeten it, and then I'll add any kind of flavorings I want to it, like fruit or spices. I don't add any of that in primary. My primary is just honey, water, yeast, and nutrients. I rehydrate my yeast with go firm, and then at pitch, I add Fermate O and Fermate K. Then I have two additions on day two and day four of Fermate O. That's my general go-to for mead making. It works for me, it produces an amazing mead, so I don't have much desire to change it. So if you'd like to make mead my way, that's good. But if you think I'm wrong, and you'd like to try a different way, that's good too. This topic is full of opinions, and most of them are wrong. Except raisins. Raisins as nutrients is wrong. Another much more simpler way that uh, I feel my way is better, but I wouldn't say this way is wrong. I've tasted mead made this way, and it is top shelf mead. The guy also ferments with a clean neutral yeast, such as EC1118, but then he uses just generic yeast nutrient. Could go to your home brewing store, go to Amazon, buy just a generic yeast nutrient. And then divide that down into, add it according to the manufacturer's specifications. If the manufacturer says add one teaspoon per gallon, measure out that one teaspoon, how many gallons you have. And then divide that into three additions. Add nothing at pitch, add one addition on day one, two, three, four, etc., etc. I don't particularly like that idea of nutrients, but there's a saying, if it works, don't fit, if it's, if it's not broke, it, well, there's some sort of saying about that. It works. I've tasted meat made like that. It's wonderful. So I can't say it's wrong, but I still prefer my way. So if you like to keep things basic and simple, just ferment with a neutral yeast like EC1118, DV10, uh, Uva Firm 43, and you can either just buy generic yeast nutrient and stagger some additions with that according to the manufacturer's instructions, or you can rehydrate with the Go Firm, use the Firm 8O and the Firm 8K, and so on and so forth. I'll put links to all those nutrients in the description. Buy some of that, either the generic stuff or the OK and Go Firm and make wonderful meat. Now that is only my opinion. And while I do disagree that it is wrong, I do not disagree that it might not be the best way. There might be better ways. There might be worse ways too, but hey, let's not go there. So let's see what some other people are doing. Let's ask some other brewers and some scientists 
what they think, their ideas about nutrition. Let's start with my friend, Dr. Bray Dinner. What do you generally do with nutrients? Oh, you're frozen. I'll just front load everything because it goes so fast for me that it, like, there's no way I catch it. And you're just gonna end up adding nutrients that don't get used. And then that's, you know, most of these nutrients that aren't DAP, if you sufficiently clear the mead, it's not gonna affect your flavor. Oh, okay. uh, that's only not true for DAP. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's one of those things where I, I still don't want it floating around though, because the other consideration is for, especially for low alcohol meads, is if you have too many nutrients floating around, you're inviting infections. Yeah. Whereas if you have high ABV, then it's a very small chance you're gonna have any problems with infections. Um, but then anything above 1.100, I generally do two or three additions. It just depends on how high the gravity is and what it is. Um, fruit, fruit you can get, get away with two. You don't really need three. Um, some protocols, if you've really designed them out, you can do two, even with high gravity, but I wouldn't suggest that for everyone. You know, that's something you got to work on for a while. Yeah. Um, but three is, is generally pretty safe. I think go. I think the uh, the Tosna protocol is four additions or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've always found that my ferments go too fast. Like, I just missed the last one anyway, so might as well just front load it. Did, does all that include the upfront addition? So, to my knowledge, so there's a lot of people that say that don't add up front, mm -hmm. uh, and they're specifically referring to the Tosna style protocols using dry yeast. Um, but I've always front loaded up front. I've never had any issues at all. Um, so I, you know, if you ask, you know, five meat makers their nutrient protocol, you'll get ten protocols. Yeah, so. that's, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm interviewing uh, several people because I'd like other opinions instead of just mine and all this, you know. Because yeah. someone someone asked me what nutrient do I use and how much, I'll tell them what I do, and then the next guy's going to tell me that's wrong, and the next guy's going to tell him that he's wrong, and so on and so forth. You know. My guess is that there's multiple ways to get to the goal. And the, the key thing you can do is, you know, if, if, if someone's mead tastes better than yours, maybe you should listen to them. Like, yes, exactly. <laughs> Take advice from those who are winning, you know? <laughs> yes. So if their mead doesn't taste as good as yours, then maybe you're doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's the only thing I can say. Until you taste their mead, how do you know? Okay, so what, what advice, if, if, if somebody came to you with, with, and, and gave you no more information and said, what nutrients do I use in my mead and how much? What would you say? That's like a, just a basic general question. Well, I mean, these days I'm pretty technical, so I'm going to you know measure yan and all that kind of stuff. But the main thing I would say is, first of all, make sure you have a source of nitrogen and make sure you have a source of trace nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. That's the, the key thing. Don't use just one or just the other. You need both. Mm -hmm. That's going to make your yeast happy. So start with that. Um, whatever you can get your hands on, you know, you'll have to figure out which is what category. Yeah. But once you've got your hands on that, then you can start working out dosing. So I would say start with three doses. I do one up front, one on day two, one on day four. This is assuming everything goes well. Now, if you kill your yeast when you rehydrate them because it's too hot, or if you get a bad bag of liquid yeast that just never starts up, well, of course, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna apply. So I would still keep gravity so that you know it is progressing properly. Yeah. Um, you know, once you've got your system set up, like I do, like you can get away with just doing day zero, two, and four. Um, but but initially, when you're working things out, keep keep an eye on your gravity from day to day. And I just leave the hydrometer spinning in there. You know, just sterilize it ahead of time and leave it in there. Um, oh, I never thought of that. That's a good idea. Just put it in there and leave it. That way you can just see it through the carboy and stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically degassing has been debunked. There's really no, you don't have to degas. I mean, I still swirl it a little bit just to get the yeast in solution. 
but I'm not going to do like a full on drill, like really trying to whenever, get every. Uh, <laughs> whenever it, it I just doesn't matter. Yeah, whenever I add nutrients, I'll pick it up and shake it around to degas a little bit because I've, I've had a volcano before. And um, yeah. Yeah. But you're not really degassing, you're just trying to swirl the yeast back into solution. Exactly. That's a completely yeah. separate thing. Um, so so those would be my suggestions. I would say start with three, and then, you know, as you get comfortable with the process and you see that things are progressing well, you know, maybe start knocking it back to the same amount of nutrients, but maybe only two additions and see what that looks like. But I will say this, three is safe. No matter what, you add three additions, it's going to be good. So, um, as is long as that, that, as is long that, as that last addition isn't the DAP. I'm sorry. Is is that uh, front loaded nutrients plus three additions? No. Day zero, two, and four. Okay, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> most most fermentations with the classic nutrient schedule are going to be around seven to ten days. Uh -huh. So you should be pretty safe with that. Yeah. Um, but keeping up with your gravity, I'll let you know. Now, Brian and I talked quite extensively about this, and he gave me lots and lots of awesome information. But I didn't want this video to be two hours long. Nobody wants to sit through two hours of nutrition. So I only took the relevant or the most relevant information from that interview and put it in this video. And I have done likewise with the rest of these interviews, especially the one with Scott Labs. That was a long wonderful conversation almost 45 minutes long but as i said i don't want this video to be forever long so i just took the most relevant information out of that and i'm going to put it in this video but i'm going to make a second video with a full unedited interviews from all these people and i'll put a link to that in the description it's going to be about two hours long maybe a little longer and i'll divide it down by chapters so you can see you know so you can click on which interview you'd like to watch but moving on from bray Let's talk to Homebrew City, a winemaker from TikTok. Let's see what he has to say about nutrition. All right, well, since we're talking history, let's start with history. Uh, you <laughs> asked some good questions to me prior, directly, so I did a little bit of research. So I'm not just some drunk lunatic talking on screen. Uh, earliest reference I could find to a staggered nutrient addition or steep nutrient addition was from Ken Schramm back in 2005. If that tells you anything. Um, and his numbers are completely different than anything else I've seen as well, even from the man himself. So. I've, I've never heard about this. Yeah, uh, it's it goes nuts. The article, Optimizing Honey Fermentation, published in Zymergy, November, December 2005. And he staggered nutrients. He staggered it back then. Wow. Yeah, the staggers are quite a bit different than it is now. Uh, he says for the first three days, the first three days he has his own segment of nutrients but i'd rather follow one of his new earlier or later yeah. versions but uh in short what he said he used was ba -ba -bam. pull this up now i can't find it oh well <laughs> anyways he, he used a a split of for k and dap which is what it came down to yeah so he just mixed them. To, he just mixed them together, and then just added some over day zero, one, day two, and day three. I wonder what his results were like. Uh, probably pretty good. <laughs> but it's Ken Shram. He can he can make good meat without nudes at all. So I mean, he can do whatever he wants. Um, something that I saw was very good with um, a lot of his articles on there was if you're not using nutrients and you're having stuff that you really like keep doing it because that's the that's... end goal if you like it keep on it but the the nutrients that i normally do uh, yeah what what do you normally use what i normally use i use a complete triple blend of formato formate k and dap uh -huh. i have done this because of what was written i uh i have references here uh travis blount elliot or blount Elliot elliot uh -huh. Uh, it's on the Batch Builder. Yeah, he's a toss my guy. .com, batch Builder, it's what I use if I'm doing something good, large, important. The reason I do it this way is because he has written down, he has sources on it, and it's what you said when you're going for a hike, which makes more sense, one yeah. big breakfast in the morning, or do you want to snack throughout the hike? It, it, you want to snack throughout the hike, that way you're 
third generation yeast still have nutrients to eat and you're not heating out and then kicking out all those high out fusels at the tail end of your fermentation. So, so you take uh, KO and DAP and mix it together, and do you add the same? Do you add the same at pitch and on day one, two, three, or whatever, or is it equal, uh, equal amounts each time? It's not equal amounts. It actually peters off towards the end, because once he gets towards the end of it, the fermentation is not as much left to ferment. Your yeast colony is already started to cannibalize stuff, so you get to do a little bit less as you want. But not by not by a whole lot. This is uh this is for wine. You mostly make wine, yes. Um, I mostly make beer. I do this for mead, and I do less for wine. Wine has more nutrients in it than honey because the grape skins and the grape must is all wonderful, nutrient rich. Um, same with cider. Cider, I throw apple skins and apple cores into my cider that I rack off of eventually because that's just nutrients for the yeast. Do you, what nutrients do you use in beer making, if any? Um, I don't None. use a single nutrient in beer. I have, I have about two pounds of malted barley per gallon of beer, and that has enough yeah. nutrients in it. Uh, yeah. That's what you see in the protein break at the end when you cold crash, all that wonderful congealing cloudiness that settles and that drops. Uh -huh. that's, that's all nutrient, that's yeast nutrient. Uh, yeah. I've, I've only made beer a handful of times. I don't think I, I think I added nutrient once. And but I, I've heard the same thing too. All the nutrients that you need is in the grains and the barley and the hops and, and all that. And there's those are those grains. Those grains have so much nutrient in it, and that it gets sucked out in the mash process. A friend of mine has chickens. He gave his chickens beer grains, like spent grains for a week because he was just doing brew after brew after brew after brew and just had so much of it. Chickens stopped laying eggs. They just thought it stopped laying eggs because there's nothing left in those grain hulls. The chickens were barely surviving because all the nutrients is in that beer that you're drinking. That's why the monks could go and eat nothing during Lent because they were just drinking low EBV beer and there, that was chock and that, and that full was plenty. everything yeah. needed to survive. Again, he and I talked for quite some time about nutrition. If you'd like to see the entire conversation between him and I on this topic, there's a video in the description that has that. Moving on to doing the most. Let's see what doing the most thoughts are on nutrition. Big creation, fermentation, and creation, doing the most. Okay, trying to be as general as possible, what do you think is the best nutrient protocol for meat making? For mead making, yes. Um, you know, it's a matter of opinion, but I <laughs> it, am a. It really uh, is. I'm what I I unapologetically refer to as a lazy brewer, and so I like Tazna 2.0 because it requires Formido, and yeah. uh, there is a batch builder website out there that I can plug my information in. What nitrogen requirement, my yeast is, batch size, all of that, what my attenuation is going to be, and in, in the cloud just calculates it and tells me what it to do. Does it all for you, yeah. <laughs> so that's my preference. Um, in winemaking, it's a little bit different. Sometimes I'll mix in a little dap at the beginning, um, you know, to, um, to supplement, where I, I use a little bit of that uh, non-organic derived nitrogen at the mm -hmm. beginning and then use my more expensive nutrient later on. Give it that initial boost to get it going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in mead making, I'm all Tazna 2.0 and Fermita now. And now that is, that's for anything that's going to be like above 8% potential ABV. For uh, lower ABV stuff like hydromels, session meads, I will Sagas. usually use Fermato, but, but I'll front load it. So mm -hmm. I'll just throw in, depending on the yeast, like between 8 and 12 grams of Fermato right at the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. within the first 24 hours after yeast pitch, and then just let it ride. I'm sure some of you watching so far are wondering why I haven't included Tazna in my nutrition advice. I don't use Tazna myself, but I do admit it is a very 
very good and very tailored system of nutrients. You can either Google Tosna or you can go to this website right here. I'll put a link to that in the description. But it is a much more tailored a nu nutrient schedule it takes into account your gravity, what type of yeast you're using, what type of additives you're using, and it automatically calculates for you exactly how much nutrient you should be adding and at what times. It has options for either an all Fermate O system or a Fermate O and a Fermate K mix. It has all kinds of things. It's a very good resource. You should definitely check it out. Which brings us to Scott Labs. When I first thought of the idea for this video, I wanted an interview with Scott Labs to be in there. That was sort of like the driving force behind this whole video. I wanted to talk to Scott Labs. I wanted to ask him all kinds of questions. And my dream came true. They responded to my email. There was a little bit of back and forth. And then I got my interview. And it was awesome. It was fun. Dr. Nicola Hall is so knowledgeable on this topic. And she was able to explain everything in like simple terms so she doesn't confuse you with a bunch of big words and stuff. It was a wonderful interview. I had a really good time. But it was 45 minutes long. And to keep this video as short as possible, here are a few excerpts from that interview. In mead making, honey is almost all sugar. Almost nothing but sugar. Uh, what, what would you suggest for the optimal nutrition uh, system for, for mead making? So when we're, when we're planning our nutrient system, it depends on a couple of things. What yeast strain are you using? For mead, I would suggest generally a straight forward EC 11A or a DV10. EC 1118, it's my favorite yeast. That's neutral fermenter, right? Something that is a strong fermenter that has low nutrient needs because you don't have any nutrients to begin with. The second part of that answer is how much sugar does your yeast need to ferment? The more sugar, the more nutrients are required. Okay. So using your low nitrogen requiring yeast, your EC triple one eight, your DV10, for every one gram per liter of sugar, the yeast needs about three quarters of that sugar in nitrogen. So what I would normally do is take my sugar in grams per liter, times it by 0 0.75, and that tells me how much nitrogen I need. If you're 24 bricks, roughly, okay, if that's your average, and you're using your low nitrogen requiring strain, we use one gram of yeast per gallon, okay? So for every gram of yeast per gallon, we use 1.25 grams of Go Farm Protect Evolution in our rehydration water. That's a constant ratio, okay, irrespective of your sugar. We can pretty much use that as a baseline. For every gram of yeast, add 1.25 grams of Go Farm. Yep, because you're giving that population of yeast the specific vitamins, minerals, and sterols. Now, when we get into the fermenter, when that yeast goes into the fermenter, that's when the amount of sugar varies, and that's why it's hard to do a standard. But in general, I would say if you're around about 24 bricks, bricks is percent sugar, at the onset of fermentation, so we'd say two to three bricks drop, we would use about a gram and a half per gallon of fermate O. We want to use our organic nitrogen at the onset of fermentation. You wouldn't add anything else at pitch. You would add the first addition when, when, when did you say? Two to three bricks drops just at the onset of fermentation. Oh, okay. So you'd let it ferment with, with no, nothing at pitch except for the go firm. Yeah. And then start staggering. So what next? And then around about a third of the way through, so we have our staggered nutrient additions, remember, because we have nutrients for proliferation and then nutrients for maintenance. So our nutrients for maintenance are a third of the way through. That's really when you would add your Fermi K. And we would add about two grams, a gram and a half to two grams per gallon. And that would be enough nitrogen to get us through a standard 24% sugar. If you've got more sugar than that, you're going to have to add a little bit more. If you've got less sugar, you could add a little bit less. And what that little bit would be is depending on that sugar. And of course, the yeast strain. So in your opinion, the ideal nutrient schedule is rehydrate with the GoFirm 
and then an addition of firm firm A dough and then an addition of firm A K after the one third sugar break. That's if your goal is fermentation security with no sensory deviations. If we want to start to add fruits in there and we want to change the flavor profile and have more of a yeast impact, then we would change that up slightly, but just for a straightforward sugar ferment. So that's just a, that's just a neutral ferment. Mm -hmm. That's what we would do. Fermentation security being the primary goal. Now, if we wanted to start playing around with ester stimulation for the yeast, and esters are fermentation-drive compounds that are fruity or floral, then we wouldn't use Fermi K, we'd use something called a stimula. And specifically, we would use something called stimula chardonnay. It's not like it's for chardonnay, just that Chardonnay producers were kind of some of the first to say, hey, we want to amp up the fruitiness in this, and that's just why it's called Stimula Chardonnay. It's really Stimula Fruity Floral Ester production. A lot of a lot of home brewers, myself included, we almost have like a one-size-fits-all nutrient schedule. You know, we use this much Go Firm and this much Firm Ado and this much Firm AK. And um, we use that same that, that same schedule for every ferment. Would you say, uh, I'm sure that's less than ideal, but what's your opinion on that? You know, sometimes if it's not broken, go with it. If it's not broke, don't fix it. But you're never going to know if you could do something better, produce something with better aromatics, cleaner aromatics, better fermentation time, better fermentation kinetics, unless you play around with things. And to play around with things, you've got to be pretty specific in what your goal is, what your sugar is, what your yeast strain is, okay? But if you're making five gallons, it's not broken, you like what you're producing, but if you don't push it, you're never going to find if you do something better. We, we'll have clients call all the time and they've been doing something for years, love the outcome, it's exactly what they want. If, I, if they had to describe what they wanted, they're getting it. And it's like, but you don't recommend this yeast for this specific outcome. It's not in your book. I need to change. No, you don't need to change. You're doing, you're producing exactly what you want to produce. And you're happy with all the factors. I often put potassium carbonate in with my nutrients when I'm when I'm fermenting. So the goal with carbonate is you're trying to to buffer the solution. And what we mean by buffer the solution is to stop having vast pH swings. Shh. Without sounding um, demeaning, your meat starter is sugar water, right? There's nothing really in there other than that. I mean, the honey source is very important. We know we get great different flavors from the honey, right? But there's nothing else in there to absorb these ions that are shifting around. So you have a huge plunge in pH at the beginning of fermentation. The potassium carbonate is helping to manage that that pH. Um, by adding some salts, you're adding back some buffering. So this is a good thing. It's a good thing. If need, it's a good thing. If you'd like to see that entire interview, there is a link in the description below. Now, all of you guys who spoke to me about this, thank you so much. This video couldn't happen without you. So hopefully this has answered many of your questions about nutrition in not just meat making, but home brewing in general. It's not really that much of a big deal in beer, but it is a big deal in wine and cider. And it is huge in mead because honey is so bereft of nutrients and vitamins and minerals and all that. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, give me a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed already, please do so. And thank you so much for watching.